55, and the two bandwidth that uh, normally are devoted to maintenance services, which means uh, 1625 and uh, 1650. Normally, we can have a system that in case one are operating in the first window so that we can allocate our maintenance wavelength everywhere in the other three bands. Or we can have systems which are operating in the second window. We have still three bands to allocate, available to allocate our maintenance uh, wavelength. If we have both windows, second and third, used on the same fibers, we have uh, still two bandwidth to allocate the uh, maintenance. In the third case, in which we are using also, in the fourth, sorry, case, in which we are using also the bandwidth 1625 to transmit uh, information data, there is still the last band which is uh, available to transmit maintenance wavelength. Now, we have the last few slides to introduce the concept of uh, rich extenders, which means, it simply means that uh, for some reasons, I could like to have uh, reaches which are longer than 20 kilometers. This can be due mainly to two different reasons. I just explained them yesterday. The first one is simply to reach users which are uh, very distant from the central office. The second, which is more important according to my point of view, is to have a concentration of central office delivering access in order to put all requirement, all required equipment in just one central office. For example, the central office which is located at the center of the large, of the large city. In this case, to reach an extension, we have to change our mind about passive and we have to put somewhere in the, the network some active element, which simply means that my OLT, my OLT in the reality will be replicated here and I will have just a trunk transport between the two. Of course, this is a strong point. I have to power feed my extender, which was not our intention at the beginning when we started with passive optical networks. 70, sorry, 70 should uh, be read uh, as uh, 60 and uh, 10 should be read then as 20. The sum is still 80, but is distributed differently. This is the original diagram from the recommendation. Please note that uh, there is an error, there is a mistake uh, in the drawing, in the recommendation. This one should be read OTL and non, not OLT. It is an optical trunk line, it's not uh, an optical line transmitter. It's a transmission line. This is the reference diagram. The novelty is the mid-span. There is another error. This is not spam. It's a span, of course. I have to notify someone at ITU of the two errors in the same drawing. It's mid-span extender. And uh, let I see how the extender is done. 
these are two possible configuration. The first one is by means of optical amplifiers. The signal is coming from the OLT this direction. The wavelengths are separated and the wavelength in one direction and in the other direction are separated. The downstream is amplified here. The upstream, which is coming from here, is amplified here. Of course, this is still an active element because I have to power the optical amplifier. Another option could be the use of digital electrical regeneration in which the signal is received, taken down at electrical level, reshaped and retransmitted. The same in the direction from the ONU towards the OLT. This is not recommendation. This is uh, current study period. What uh, are we doing in ITUT in the period from 2009 to 2012? Speaking about next generation access, which means next generation passive optical network, and as I told you before, these two kind of networks, max must coexist, which means that uh, the optical fiber plant will be the same, but uh, the offered service will be different. This in order to have uh, a possible migration, migration of uh, customers from GPON to NGPON. And uh, this has to be done without any uh, inconvenience to the other users of the network. And as uh, we saw, it relies of, on the deployment of new types of OLT already foreseen in the recommendation 984.5 and uh, other systems of next generation that are using enhancement band. The next generation PON mainly will have a higher bit rate. The gigabit capable PON is 2.5. The next one will be 10 gigabit per second in downstream and 2.5 in the upstream. With regards to the loss budget, we saw that uh, class C budget had a maximum attenuation of 30 dB. In the meantime, other two classes, B plus and C plus, have been added. C plus has an attenuation, an attenuation, uh, a maximum attenuation which is more than 32 dB using optical amplifier both at the OLT side and the ONU side. The 1 to 64 splitting ratio is supported, but for some special application, 1 to 256 splitting ratio can be used with the optical amplifiers. One to 256 splitting ratio means 6 dB of loss more, plus something due to the insertion loss, with regard to 1 to 64. But if you put an amplifier which is able to provide you a gain of 25 fiber, 
and DB, you have done your job. Of course, the reach will not uh, increase and will not be increased because the, your customers are staying there. They are not uh, moving away from the, the central office, so there will, need, there will be no need to increase the uh, physical reach. In some cases, for example, for consolidation, you can also increase the physical reach by putting optical amplifier in uh, the network. And this is the same diagram than before in uh, which the, there is just one difference. It, of course, it is not a position of ITU, but uh, it's only a consideration which is uh, uh, taken according to operators and vendors. The, the NG PON option one, which means using uh, the G652.C dot or dot D fiber will not be used since many of the GPON in use now don't use that kind of fibers. This concludes the presentation on chapter nine, optical access system. I hope that at least five or six percent of what I said will be retain, retained by each of you and I thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, It's not 100% part of the presentation, but some clarification needed. Uh, we have IEEE, EPON, and GPON. Briefly, if, you, if there is no inconvenience, should you give us some details? Yesterday, I was uh, on my bed, and I decided to bet on this question. <laughs> I could bet on it. Well, here, this is a tutorial on uh, um, ITUT defined uh, systems, and uh, speaking about EPON was out of the scope of this uh, tutorial. Well, uh, EPON uh, has uh, an advantage. Please. Uh, as an advantage with respect to GPON, which is the mechanism of data transmission, which is Ethernet. So in a world that is going Ethernet, having EPON, EPON is a, a passive optical network which is able, still able to work at gigabit rates. Normally it uses gigabit Ethernet to transmit information, which is 1.25 gigabit per second, so it's in line with the GPON. And uh, has an advantage that uh, when you stay home, your uh, laptop or your fixed PC will send out Ethernet packet. In the GPON scheme, the Ethernet packet must be treated and encapsulated into different protocols, which will still some uh, time-consuming and power-consuming exercise. So, from this point of view, having a protocol which is able to transfer directly Ethernet frames from home to the central office is better. And this is the strongest advantage point for EPON. On the contrary, on the other side, any analysis has shown that the GPON is more costly effective. It costs, it costs less. So we have two big points. One is the advantage 
of EPON for the protocol. The other one is the advantage of the cost for GPON. Of course, GPON is able to transfer Ethernet frames, otherwise you will not be able to connect to the Internet from uh, home. But it do it in a less uh, efficient way, let's say. There are uh, other differences, but are not so important. However, there is uh, a joint effort so that all the bandwidth will be the same, uh, all the main uh, principle of the network will be the same. It's only the protocol which is uh, different. I don't know if uh, it satisfies you or... Okay. Under g points or... Okay, the poor network. When we talk of redundancy, which is the best point to have our redundancy at the splitter level or at the ONU? Well, splitters are, are already sold as redundant. You have a two fiber going inside the splitter. The ONU is uh, more simple to replace so that uh, uh, redundancy at the ONU, at least for the uh, complete ONU, is not so important. The difference is that if the splitter fails, you will have uh, all the network out of service. You will uh, have uh, 500 users or 1,000 users with no service at all. If one on and you fails, you will have a reduced number of users. We do not gain access to the service. Of course, it's not uh, a good thing, but it's uh, less important. So, but you can ask your colleague that uh, have a very uh, hands-on experience to, to reply to this question. What do you think about it? Uh, for redundancy, if you wanted to do it on your new level, this will cost a lot because you have to provide from from two different way the the two fiber. But on the splitter level, you should protect uh, the traffic using two different ORT. For example, suppose that you have a ring. If you have a ring from one way, you should connect one fiber to one ORT going to the splitter, and then connect another fiber to another ODT. And there, at least you, you, you are sure if one fiber is cut from one ODT, the traffic will be, uh, will be coming from, from, from another ODT. And in terms of uh, ODT uh, efficiency, there is a way to to synchronize even the ODT, it depends on the, on the way you are making your, your, your network. So in fact, for me, it's better to do the, the redundancy on the, or on the splitter, splitter level, because there you are protecting too many people, instead of to protect on the ODT, where you have a few, few services, like 2 ones, 4 ones, 2 g or 4 fe Thanks. Okay, I think we can have our coffee. Oh, another question. Okay, um, I have a, a question and a consideration to <coughs> that I that uh, to for it to get answer uh, regarding that uh, in general. Uh, consumers are requiring more uh, bandwidth uh, considering the broadband services that are a uh, best thing. Uh, do you think that uh, increasing split ratios for uh, ODN isn't uh, really uh, an issue? 
uh, uh, I consider, for, for example, some services requiring uh, more bit rates, such as uh, bit on, de on demand which, uh, or uh, uh, data, uh, <coughs> very, very, uh, for some, some, some if, yeah. And uh, uh, let's say, for example, that you can require 100 megabit per second for one user. Uh, if, if you consider a split ratio of 256, is it really an issue uh, to, to deliver uh, bit rates for, uh, for the, uh, what, what can I say for, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, the question is, uh, bandwidth requirement from end users are increasing. For example, uh, video on demand will consume a lot of bandwidth. For example, 100 megabit per second. It will be less, but we can think about 100 megabit per second. If we increase the split ratio up to 1 to uh, 256 or how we, can we comply with the bandwidth requirement? Well, there are different options. The first one, we are speaking of a next generation access network, which means that we are increasing, we are increasing the uh, number, the bit rate from 2.5 to uh, 10 gigabit per second, but it is not so important because it is only a factor of four. But we should also rely on the fact that uh, there is uh, some sort of uh, statistical approach by which not all your users are going to watch a video on demand in the same time. Moreover, if uh, this happens, in general, it will be for the same event. It can be, for example, for a football match all the people are going to see the same football badge. But this is very simple to solve by means of broadcasting cells, which means multicast. I will send just once the, the video. No? I will not send uh, 10 or 20 or 25 copies of the same video. Okay, this is the outline of the presentation. I will speak about optical monitoring, which means uh, as soon as you build a, net a communication network, how to monitor it in order to understand that uh, it is working properly or if it is not working properly. After I We'll have uh, a few words about uh, submarine systems. And uh, at the end, safety. What's the meaning of safety in this context? Means uh, mainly the fact that uh, in optical systems, we have a new kind of components, for example, laser diodes or power amplifier, which are very powerful source of uh, optical radiation and can be dangerous for the human health. So that uh, a lot of uh, precautions must, must be taken to safeguard uh, the, the technicians working with the system. Optical monitoring. Optical monitoring is uh, very important for two different uh, kind of reasons. The first one is that the fiber is being deployed in the access network, which means a lot of fiber in large cities, which means a lot of fibers in single central offices. And 
It means uh, new infrastructures in the access network, which means uh, enclosures, cabinets, and passive optical components. Uh, in the same time, WDM is uh, being used very pervasively, which means that there are a great number of optical network elements which, are, which have to be monitored by the uh, network management systems. In order to get uh, both low maintenance cost and uh, good reliability for uh, the service. We, we come from uh, SDH networks in which the performance of the system was measured at electrical level. In the, in the overhead of the frame, there were a lot of uh, specific bytes which were devoted to evaluate the performance. For example, there were uh, a few byte devoted to CRC, the uh, cyclic redu redundancy coding, and uh, from the uh, examination of uh, those bytes, you could understand if any error was present in the previous frame. Now, as I told you the day before yesterday, we are going to networks which are all optical. The optical transport network is evolving towards an all optical networks in which uh, we will not have any more signals at electrical level. Signal at electrical level will be present only outside the optical transport network. Well, in this uh, case, since uh, we don't have any access to the electrical frame, we need to perform some monitoring in the optical domain, which means we have to assess the performance directly on the optical signal which is going along the fibers. This is uh, a representation of a link in a, a typical WDM system inside an optical transport network. It is a very important picture, so please follow me in the explanation. Here we are in the central office. The client is an electrical signal. It can be an SDH signal. It can be a gigabit Ethernet signal. It can be some, something else. The client is transformed into an optical signal by adding some overhead, as we saw on Thursday. Afterwards, all the client, all the optical channels are multiplexed together inside an optical multiplexer and transmitted in the line. As you can see, the only way to have again the signal at some intermediate level, a client, not really a client, but an electrical signal, is inside the regenerators. But regenerators are going to be suppressed in the network. That means that you will have, this is optical, you will have your signal always at optical level. You will get it again at electrical level at the other central office when going out of the network. So it is very important to have some means to monitor the proper working at optical level. Monitoring 
does not simply mean evaluation of the performance, but is also provisioning, which means configuration, activation of the channels, addition of new channels, fault management, detection, in order to be able to isolate faults and to reroute the signal, and moreover, an activity which is really very important is the performance monitoring in order to understand in time if some parameters is degrading in order to be able to intervene before the fault occurs. So, for example, I spoke a few days ago about quality factor. If we have a means to control the quality factor, to measure the quality factor, we can understand that the quality factor is degrading. And in such a way, we are in a position to be able to look for possible faults in the network. Possible fault could be, let's say, a connector which is uh, breaking, a splice, an optical amplifier which is not more able to provide you the gain for which it was designed. It was designed for 25 dB of gain and uh, is, uh, it is actually providing only 20 or 18. If you can monitor the performance of the amplifier, you can tell a technician, please go there and change the amplifier. Of course, monitoring can be done in different ways. One way is to have embedded monitoring equipment, which means that each network element comes with its own monitoring equipment, which are embedded in the network element, or we can use external equipment, which normally are used to, measure, to perform more accurate measurements. If we don't want to say, to know if the quality factor is seven or eight or nine, but we are interested in 7.35, we should use some external equipment. The external monitoring is normally used to locate failures which are hard to locate or to perform a functional test. Sometime in the life of the system, maybe every week or every day, we perform a functional test to understand if the system is still in the same working condition that it had when we deployed it. We have a set of uh, parameters in the network that can be measured. We are, here we have a provisional list, it's uh, an important list, but we have also other parameters that I have not listed because they are too many. But we can monitor the channel power, which means the power that is transported by every optical wavelength. The total power which is the sum of the power transported by the single channels, the OSNR, which is the optical signal-to-noise ratio, we can also measure the channel wavelength. You know from the recommendation 694.1 and .2, that uh, grids are provided by ITUT. According to the grids, we have to select our operating wavelength. ITU also says which is the maximum deviation that 
the actual signal can have with respect to the grid, which means if the laser wavelength is moving, how much, can, are, how much is it allowed to move? Well, channel wavelength monitoring simply means that we are going to measure the channel wavelength. And the most important of the parameters, we have monitoring equipment which are able to measure directly the Q factor of the link. From the single measurements of the parameters, we can understand which impairment we have. If we have a variation of attenuation, we could measure it by examining total power, the channel power, the OSNR, and the Q factor, and so on for the other uh, quanti meaningful quantities in the network. Well, this uh, presentation I am giving is only for information because the monitoring systems are so different. They are provided by different vendors. They apply to different networks that it is impossible to derive single recommendations. So the ITU try only to make a list of the parameters that have to be monitored, but do not recommend any procedure or any evaluation procedure. Uh, neither any recommendation is provided regarding the accuracy with which the parameters have to be measured. Of course, the choice, the final choice for the parameters will depend on the optical network element to be monitored and on the characteristics of the transmission system, which means how many channels, what spacing between channels, and so on. We have a, a list of important consideration to be made, like length, numbers of span, numbers of channels, inaccessibility of the sites, because uh, it's very important to be able to monitor uh, some uh, site where the access is very difficult to gain. And uh, we have also to make some uh, cost benefits consideration because uh, using optical monitoring can be sure save some money, but if the cost of the monitoring is too high, it's useless to save money spending 10 times uh, the, that money for monitoring. Moreover, monitoring is really very useful. We can have uh, the parameters available both locally and the central point. However, since the number of points to monitor is very high, I am going to consume more power. I am going to consume more signal power because uh, to monitor a channel, I have to take a few photons out of from the channel. I have to derive some power, otherwise how can, I, how can I measure the signal power if I do not derive, for example, one-tenth of the signal power? And this will uh, produce a decrease of the performance. Moreover, it will increase 
the space required for equipment and uh, it will increase uh, the footprint of the equipment, the area which is uh, used by the equipment. This is an example of uh, possible embedded monitoring systems where EME stays for embedded monitoring equipment. As you can see, the red circles, the small red circles, um, show the position of uh, such embedded monitoring equipment. I don't want to enter into details because uh, if you look with attention to the slide, it is self-evident. But, for example, here, if I monitor the optical power entering the amplifier, and if I monitor the optical power that is going out from the amplifier, I can have a good estimation of the amplifier gain. The same time, here, I can measure the wavelength. Here, I can measure the electrical parameters of the signal, and so on. So, putting network, putting EME in different parts of the network, I can have a global look of the system performance. This table refers to the previous diagram. I will not enter into details, but uh, I will illustrate you simply how to read the table. In each row, we have a description of the parameter we want to monitor. Well, for example, channel input power. We can monitor the channel input power in position 1 and 11. If we go back to the previous, 1 is here. Eleven is here. So this is the received power, the received optical power. And uh, the like all other parameters listed in the rows correspond to red circle on the di on the previous diagram. Another part of the network, which is very important to monitor, because uh, as we saw, the maximum number of allowed fault is uh, really very low, not more than three fault per 25 years for the C plant. It's the submarine system. In the summary system, we have a very important supervisory system which executes maintenance on a routine basis. Maintenance is executed by the terminal station by means of a dedicated supervisory system. Each of the system parameter is monitored at some time intervals in order to be able to make a preventive redundancy switching whenever we understand that some component is going to fail. For example, if we have repeaters in the summer implant, the transmitter of each repeater will be equipped at least with two laser sources, one working and one in standby. If from monitoring we understand that 
the laser is degrading before it breaks and put out of the serv out of service the system we will make a switch and we will change the transmitting laser the maintenance the controller for supervision and maintenance is located in the terminal equipment in the repeaters or in the branching unit and is able to allow fault localization, monitoring of the repeater performance and redundancy switching from remote. In a repeaterless system, maybe that uh, all what is needed is an OTDR, the OTDR which stays for optical time domain reflectometer is a very popular optical instrument which sending a pulse, very short pulse and powerful pulse inside the one fiber end is able to detect from the same end through the reflected signal, they at, the, at least the attenuation of the fiber, but also the presence of uh, splices and uh, other anomalous reflection, which are an index of a possible fault. If uh, I break the fiber in some point, a lot uh, a lot of light will be reflected at that point and this can be seen on the OTDR display so that uh, since the measurement is uh, accurate in terms of uh, meter or tens of meter if uh, the fiber starts to break because for example or to increase the attenuation because for example in a submarine cable, there is a water penetration, I will know immediately with the confidence of some tens of meter where the break starts. Moreover, I can use other, um, other techniques to understand if the fault is uh, only on the fibers or is also on the cable because uh, we, I can have uh, simply a fiber that breaks or I can have uh, a cable with a fault. If I measure the resistance of uh, cable metallic parts, I can understand uh, where the fault is. There are other um, measurement system or uh, fault localization localization system, for example, sending a low frequency signal between 4 and 50 Hz, injecting it in the cable. The ship, which is in charge for repairing the cable, will uh, be able to detect the signal along the, the cable and to understand where the fault is, whenever the signal disappears. This method can be used up to 100 kilometers from the source, from the terminal equipment, sorry. And with the repeaters, the first localization is made by means of uh, the supervisory system and the supervisory section where the fault occurs is uh, detected. For uh, other uh, sections, for example, the ending uh, sections, uh, we can use uh, still the OTDR. The problem with the OTDR is that the reach is limited. Good OTDR are uh, able to detect faults up to 100 kilometers, but if you have uh, long submarine cables extending from uh, 
one continent to another continent, you will need the supervisory system for intermediate section. By the way, there is my USB stick circulating. There is also a directory with uh, the recs inside, the recommendation inside. Not, all, not any recommendation from ITU, but the recommendations in force, uh, the, mo the most important for optical systems. You can copy them to avoid downloading from ITU. Well, now imagine we have detected the fault. One of the three times we have to repair a fault in 25 years. The cable is on the bottom of the sea, maybe 3,000 meters deep. To repair, we have to take the cable and to bring it to the sea surface. It is a very dangerous operation because the cable will experience its own weight when being put in vertical. So the fiber will be stressed. To avoid this occurrence, normally the cable is cut at the point of the fault in order to have only half of the total weight when having the cable in vertical. Moreover, the summary cable has been built in order to resist to a vertical position for a limited number of hours, which normally is 72 hours, three days. So when starting a reparation, a repair of the fault, I have to check meteo conditions to be able to understand if I will, I can use the following three days at full time for repair. Because if there is a tempest or something worse, I have to suspend repair and the cable can be damaged permanently. Of course, the cable is very dangerous from an electrical point of view because as I told you two days ago, there are some 15 kilovolts going along the center metallic strength member. So that one has to be sure that during the repair, the power feeding is uh, removed to avoid exposition of technicians to hazards. We can have a different repair procedure for a shallow water or deep sea repair and uh, of course, uh, to enter into details, it's out of the scope of this uh, presentation, but you can find something written here or you can have a deeper look into the handbook. Now, we come back to the optical systems, also terrestrial optical system. And uh, we try to understand if uh, optical system can be dangerous to humans. Well, <laughs> there is uh, a joke saying that uh, the highest danger when using an optical fiber is to put the optical fiber into the eye because uh, of the size, uh, the fact that you can harm your eye. But for a long time, the power which was used 
inside the optical fiber, I mean the light power, was dangerous for the eye. Now that we have moved to the third window, we are operating in a region in which the light is no more dangerous for the eye, at least at those uh, uh, optical levels. I mean, in a fiber you can have uh, some tens of milliwatt of optical power. Even if you take the fiber and you inspect it with the eye, you will, have, uh, we, you will not have uh, any problem. Of course, you could use a microscope. Well, you are, you are trying, you are in search of uh, dangers. You have not to use optical means, microscopes or uh, lenses or, or so. For normal use, the message is that the fiber is not dangerous. ITU is not really in charge for uh, establishing safe levels of operation because this matter is uh, studied and recommended uh, or prescribed by other bodies like uh, IEC. What uh, ITU does is simply to uh, copy the prescription inside its own recommendation or, of course, uh, telling the reader that the content has been um, defined by IEC and so on. These recommendations, which are derived by other bodies' recommendations, can be the only ones that you are not able to download from the ITU site because they are related to other bodies' rights so that ITU cannot distribute them freely. The guideline for safe working conditions in optical fiber system are listed in recommendation 664 and uh, they deal both with uh, safety of the eye and safety of the skin. The only point for uh, if we are working on an optical system, the really very dangerous equipment is the Raman amplifier, since the Raman amplifier is able to provide as high power as several watts. And several watts are dangerous at any wavelength. These are the IEC norms dealing with uh, optical safety. They are the 60,000.825.1 and uh, .2, which are strictly related to the use of laser in telecommunication system. Another norm, the last one, the bottom one, regards the use of optical amplifier, including, this is very important, Raman amplifier. When uh, the beginning, the first, uh, well, let try to have a picture of the framework. What's the meaning of a high safe system? Of course, I can simply say, pay attention that since in system XXX.ZZZ, the power level is dangerous to the eye, please do not 
put your eye just in front of the transmitter. This is a recommendation, but it is not very worthwhile to have such a recommendation because there will be always a technician or other people that will not read the recommendation. Even if you put the warning sign, someone will not read the recommendation and will not take a look of the uh, warning sign. So that a real concern, a real concern from ITU would be, please don't use or don't sell systems which are potentially dangerous. When uh, we started with the first uh, optical system on a single channel, on a single fiber, which is recommended in G.957, actually the power level originated by the transmitter were unsafe. So we, we started with the wrong leg. But uh, we were, we had uh, a trick which was to automatically stop laser emission any time the front connector was removed. It means simply that if I remove the connector from the transmitter, which is expo expose me to a dangerous situation, the receiving SDH equipment will detect loss of power and automatically will send back a message to the transmitter to switch off the laser. This was the automatic laser shutdown procedure, which, which was recommended inside the G957 to avoid exposure of the eye to dangerous light. But uh, in the following, the dangerous power level were, were revised and uh, the, new, the new versions 